Hello, uh, my name is Itai Brezis. I'm uh, VP Head of Strategy for NICE Systems. Uh, this is my first time uh, in Lisbon, so I'm very happy to be here in this beautiful city. And thank you very much for giving uh, me the opportunity to talk to you a little bit today about two things. Uh, the first thing is going to be about the Israeli case study um, and showing why Israel turned into a hub of uh, inter entrepreneurship and innovation um, as it is today. Um, and in the second part, we'll talk about NICE Systems as a case study for a company that started in Israel. Uh, most of its business is outside uh, of, of Israel. We'll talk a little bit about NICE. NICE, just so you, you know, is uh, an enterprise software company uh, around $1 billion in sales. Most of our business uh, is uh, outside of Israel, only 1% maybe in Israel, uh, around 60% in, in America, and the rest uh, in the rest of the world. So. Starting uh, to look uh, around Israel as a global hub for um, entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, I don't know if uh, you've heard about the company Waze. Uh, many of you maybe use it as your navigation alternative on your smartphone. Uh, Waze is an Israeli company that was bought a few weeks ago by Google for uh, around a billion dollars. Uh, and this was one of the last deals in a string of deals uh, that has uh, have exits of, of starts from Israel, uh, which uh, started in, in, in the 90s uh, and represent a very interesting uh, thing that we have in Israel, which is uh, a global hub for innovation entre and entrepreneurship. Um, and a few very fascinating facts that, that we can see here. Uh, Israel is the second um, in the world in venture capital availability, and this is when counting all the venture funds uh, that go into Israel, including angel funding. Um, this is second, obviously, to the US. Um, Israel has the largest number of companies listed on the NASDAQ outside of North America. So Israel is one of the smallest countries in the world, yet only behind uh, the US and Canada after North America in, in NASDAQ listed companies. Um, and it's second in the world after the US in startups that are, that are launched every year. And a few of the very interesting uh, products, which many of you know, and some of you carry these uh, in your pockets, were created in Israel. So uh, USB flash drive, those uh, small things that you use in order to uh, transfer files from computer to computer, that was uh, invented by an Israeli company called M Systems, uh, and, uh, which was later bought by SanDisk. Uh, the, the firewall, all of you use firewalls on your computer, the firewall was invented by Checkpoint, uh, an Israeli company also listed on the NASDAQ. Uh, the first, I'm sure all of you use IM, in, uh, um, instant messaging. The first instant messaging uh, program uh, was invented in Israel, um, a company uh, called ICQ that was bought later on by uh, AOL. Um, and uh, in the Xbox 360, the, uh, the camera that is uh, uh, used for motion sensing is, uh, was invented by an Israeli company called PrimeSense. Uh, really interesting things. And, and what we'll try to do is to try to explain how this happened. And to, to do this, um, there are basically three things uh, that we can see in Israel that cultivate this culture of innovation. The first is a technology ecosystem. And the technology ecosystem is, is a real ecosystem. It starts from uh, the military. The military in Israel is, a, is very highly technology-based. Um, many units, which are elite units, are based on technology. We'll see later, NICE was formed by uh, four alumni of one of these technology units. Uh, but not only that, there are defense industries that are uh, formed around the military. There's also leading universities uh, that uh, are very strong in technology-based uh, subjects. The VC industry in Israel, including incubators, including private angels, which are people that founded companies and later on sold them to, uh, to, to companies or, or made exits, uh, or after IPOs they left, they started to be angels funding themselves, uh, bringing back money to, uh, to the system. Uh, a very strong entrepreneurial culture. There are a lot of explanation for that, why that happened. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the famous ones is that uh, Jews uh, around the world migrated from country to country, and we know that uh, people who uh, need to find solutions for problems as immigrants uh, tend to kind of create this type of innovation, and this gene uh, helped create this type of entrepreneurial culture. Uh, the next point is around talent. 
The talent in Israel uh, is, is very, uh, is very co much cultivated by these universities, uh, but uh, the, uh, the interesting point that's listed here, the World Economic Forum lists Israel as uh, the most educated, skilled, and talent workforce. Uh, it has the highest uh, uh, ranking of engineers per uh, the workforce uh, uh, globally, and this, uh, this study was done for uh, OECD countries. Uh, the last point here is government support. And government support in Israel is a very interesting point because a lot of the companies that were, found, uh, that were founded as startups had support of the Office of Chief Scientists. Uh, in Israel uh, that gives both uh, uh, the loans to these companies in very attractive rates, also gives sometimes uh, 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 money which is, doesn't have to come back, uh, or, or uh, in, in some cases go, 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 uh, to come back only in situations where there is success. And this was created by an R&D law uh, that is in place in Israel for many years. Um, and the interesting point, that the highest level of government investment in R&D in the world is in Israel, around 4.6% percent of GDP, which is um, highest uh, by, by far to the second place, which is uh, the US around 2%. So three major points that help cultivate and uh, explain some of these, uh, this interesting phenomena. Uh, the, 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 the interesting question is around all this money going into the system, does it create an ROI? Is there a return on investment for all this money going in? Uh, and this interesting study that was done by uh, the Israeli Venture Capital Research Center uh, answers this question with an overwhelming yes. Uh, you can see here in white, there is the number, the dollars, uh, in billions of dollars going into the, the, uh, the uh, 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 system in investments every year. Um, and in blue, you can see uh, the exits from the system, which are done both through uh, M&A, so companies bought by large uh, technology companies, and uh, you can see uh, there are also companies that, that IPO themselves, so uh, that were listed mostly on the NASDAQ, but also on other, uh, um, on, uh, uh, other uh, exchanges. Um, Obviously, there's a lagging indicator here because uh, obviously the, uh, it's not in the same year the money that was invested. But you can see here uh, that uh, in, there's no year here that the, the exits from the system uh, were lower and usually multiply higher. Uh, some interesting uh, data points around companies that, that were bought through these years, and these are just really uh, uh, small examples. Uh, Mercury, uh, enterprise software company bought by HP for $4.5 billion. This was in 2006. Um, Retalix, uh, another software company bought by NCR uh, last year, $800 million. And these, again, are just uh, a number of examples, uh, which are in very different uh, uh, industries here, not only in enterprise software. Uh, some of these, uh, you know, the, we have an example of a company bought by Johnson & Johnson um, in healthcare, a uh, company that did, me did medical uh, devices. So uh, across the range, very interesting uh, points around uh, exits from the, uh, the, the system in Israel. And this is not only a phenomena of companies that were formed in Israel. It's not a venture, only a venture capital type of uh, economy. We have 150 multinational companies that have created uh, research centers in Israel, either around acquisitions that ha they have done of Israeli companies or independent of that. So some companies, uh, IBM is a good example, created uh, a research center in Israel in 1949, just one year after Israel's independence, um, and has had a very big success in Israel since, has bought also uh, many companies uh, since that uh, establishment. Uh, today employs 2,000 employees in Israel around R&D, um, and uh, as you can see here, has done a number of, of acquisitions as well. Uh, Microsoft, again, uh, um, seven M&As since their uh, establishment um, uh, in 1989, uh, over 1,000 employees. Google, again, another company that formed their, uh, their company in Israel, not around an acquisition, uh, over 400 employees today, and had done several acquisitions. We talked about ways a little bit before that. Um, and eBay's uh, uh, acquisition in Israel of Fraud Sciences, this was their first acquisition, helped form their research center. Uh, they employ over 400 people uh, in Israel today. So we can see a, a, ver a vast amount of uh, multinational companies that 
have uh, tried to tap into this talent pool in Israel and to create around, uh, the, uh, around Israel their research and uh, 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 the, the, through acquisitions that they've done to cultivate this, uh, uh, this talent. So when we try to explain how this happened and why Israel was able to go beyond the Israeli market and to expand globally, we, in strategy, we talk about two types of strategies to expand globally. The first is the common way. Uh, the common way is uh, starting in your local market, uh, trying to capture uh, the market in, in your the company that you in the market that you start from, and then gradually expand to similar territories. And once you are established, to expand globally. And this is this is the uh, the, the way most companies that are global leaders in their fields. This is the way they expand. Uh, the examples for this are there. There are many. Uh, SAP is a good example for this. Sony is a very good example. Philips as well. Uh, any U.S. company, obviously, that started in the U.S. And, and, and went globally, talk about Microsoft, Oracle, any company that started in the U.S. obviously went this way. But there's another way. Uh, and the second way is what we call the Israeli way. Uh, and the Israeli way is understanding that starting from your own market doesn't have a lot of potential. Israel is a very small country. Uh, we have only 7 million people. The market in Israel for ICT is very small. And companies in Israel understand that they have to design their companies from day one to be global leaders. They think about disrupting markets globally and not locally. And this is why they are able to create a mindset which from day one doesn't look at the local market. The local market, you know, if if, com if companies want to buy, we're obviously happy to sell. But this is not the way we, we are designed. We're designed to conquer f the global market from day one. Uh, and there are not a lot of examples of, co of countries that were able to do this. Only very small countries that really don't have a local market are able to, to go beyond this. And you'll have to discuss later on. I'm sorry I can't stay with you because I have to catch a flight back. But it will be interesting for you to, dis to discuss whether uh, Portugal can do this, whether Portugal can create this mindset of, of thinking about globally from day one and not about the local market, because the local market basically takes you to this model, which is a lot a lot harder because you have to adapt the model and not create it from day one to be a global company. So having discussed uh, the model uh, of Israel as, as a global hub for entrepreneurship and for innovation, I want to talk to you about NICE. And NICE, I think, is a very good example for a company that went through the, the, the Israeli mindset, the Israeli way to go globally, uh, and to talk to you about our journey. And our journey is a very interesting one. And uh, personally, I came to NICE a year and a half ago. Uh, like many of you in the room, I started uh, my career uh, in, uh, in the world of strategy. I started in, in Bain and Company in the US. I worked there for four years and then moved to Israel and, and worked in a number of, tech, of uh, uh, telecom companies. Uh, the last one was Cellcom, which is Israel's later, largest telecom operator. So I know a lot of the challenges that, that, that you guys face uh, in the world of telecom and, and the challenges of working with your customers. Uh, and at NICE, we try to help, help companies like uh, uh, telecom operators uh, solve a lot of the problems of interaction with their, com with their customers. And we'll talk about how we, how we do this. So NICE was formed uh, in 1986. It's one of the, uh, uh, the uh, first technology, global technology companies that was formed in Israel. It was formed by four uh, friends that were together in the, in, in the same unit in the military, a unit that uh, focused on intelligence. Um, and they thought about, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, recording of, of uh, intelligence uh, in, in, in the military. Why don't we think about uh, inventing a recording technology that could be used beyond the military? We can use it in places where there's needed recording, like in contact centers. 
Um, and they started, they formed this company which, which started with this recording uh, and very quickly became uh, the largest company in the world. T till this date, we were over 40% of the global market in recording. Um, and we'll talk a little bit today how we moved from recording. We started as a recording company. Today we do a lot more than recording and uh, doing a lot of interesting applications for companies uh, like yourselves. Uh, we serve over 80% of the Fortune 100 companies in the world, so the biggest enterprises in the world are our customers. We have over 25,000 customers, as I said, mostly uh, globally, very small number in Israel, uh, around $1 billion in sales, over 3,000 employees. We serve companies in over 150 countries, uh, local offices in 35, um, and we have over 1,000 service experts uh, that implement and service our, our, uh, our products globally. So going uh, a little deeper into uh, what we do, uh, and this is our mission statement. Uh, this is what drives us. This is um, our, uh, our compass. We enable organizations to take the next best action. And the next best action is what is best for the organization when interacting with their customers by understanding their customers. We help understand what customers are trying to do. And we do this through analytics. We look at the, the big data that is created by companies like telecom companies, like banks, like insurance companies. We do very quick analytics, which is real time. We do the analysis of calls, for instance, in real time. And you should think about this, how magical it would be if you could, while one of your agents has a call with a client, in real time, you could assess whether they're, they're, they're saying the right things on the call, whether they're saying something that is prohibited to be saying, and you could get an alert in real time. The team, uh, uh, the team leader of that team could get an alert, and this is reality. This happens today. This magic happens today in real time analytics that we do today. Um, and we do this for both structured and unstructured data. But the in interesting part is the unstructured data, because many of you know structured data is easy to do when you have lists and you have uh, very uh, uh, ordered columns of data. It's very easy to do analysis of that. But when you have unstructured data, like voice, uh, and, we, and, and using this type of, of unstructured data, it's much more challenging, but it gives a lot more insight. And we do solutions for customer experience, how to improve customer experience, how to help business results, how to upsell, how to, 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 to upsell to, to customers and prevent retention. Uh, I'm sorry, prevent, uh, 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 to improve retention and to have compliance solutions and safeguarding people and assets through preventing uh, bad things from happening. So how do we do the, the, this getting closer to your customers? We basically have four things that we help companies do. The first is around knowing the customer. And knowing the customer, what it means is to have interactions and transactions capture, helping capture these transactions through recording. This is how we started. Uh, through uh, interaction analytics, under analysis of what the voice uh, conversations that happen, what do they mean? Um, understanding the customer journey. So we help uh, today, and you know this as customers as well, when you call the contact center many times, uh, you try to do something offline. You started doing something on, on your web uh, or you try to do it on your smartphone. When you call the contact center, nobody really knows what you are trying to do. The conversation starts from the beginning and it's very frustrating, both for the customer and for the company because it's, it's time that's wasted, it's resources that are wasted, and we solve this. We help organizations understand what was done offline. When you reach, the customer reached the contact center, they already know, the organization can know what they were trying to do and help leverage that to sell them, to help re uh, retain them as customers, uh, and to do things more efficiently. Um, and we capture the direct and indirect voice of the customer. Uh, we have uh, surveys applications that we use. It's called FizzBack. Uh, we help do this, and we'll try talk a little bit more about this, about closing the loop. 
The next point is about engaging employees. Um, and this is a very important point. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, people that work in contact center have a very, very hard day routine. They work in very challenging environments. Uh, every, every minute of their time is measured. We help engage them. We help do this through workforce staffing, workforce management software that we provide. We're the global leader in workforce management solutions. We help do this through performance management. We, we met, help them measure their performance in real time. We use gamification for this, which is very cool. It helps, it helps employees treat their work as a game. They get badges, they get points, they get rewards, and it keeps them engaged uh, as part of the workforce. Uh, and we use uh, analytics-driven quality evaluation to, un to give them feedback on their work, to help them keep engaged within uh, their daily routine. The third point is, we talked a little bit about real time. This is a very important point. Acting in real time uh, is something which basically creates the difference between the past and the future. This is the future of analytics. And this happens both through analysis of voice, as we talked about before, but also analysis of what happens on the desktop. So we have software that helps understand what the agent is doing in real time on their desktop and help guide them, say the right thing at the right time, and to make sure that they are following the company's policies and procedures. Um, and this is, as I said, real-time analytics, next best action, we tell, we help empower the agent to do the, to offer the, com the uh, uh, customer the next best action to do. Um, and we do this, as I said, through employee guidance and helping um, make sure that the, uh, uh, that the right thing is said to the customer in the right time. The last point is very interesting. This is something that we started to do this year. This is a very recent innovation of ours uh, in which we help companies authenticate their clients based on their voice uh, imprints. So, as you know, we record many of the, of, of the calls for the global companies. As I said, we're over 40% of the market. And we are able to verify if the customer calling is actually the customer they say they are. And you know that you, when you call a contact center, they ask you all these weird questions about what was the name of your first pet and what was the name of your uh, maiden uh, name of your mother. We eliminate all that. When you call the contact center, we can tell in less than 15 seconds whether you are the person that actually you said you are in the IVR or through, through your voice, just based on voice biometrics. Uh, and this erases usually at least a minute from the call, which is wasted today. And the, the ROI on this is very, very clear. So this is extremely cool. Uh, we already have many customers in the US which are starting to implement this already. Um, and you know, I'd recommend to you uh, in, in the fields where you are today, if you can leverage this technology, this is the cutting edge of, of how to cut time from the calls, make, making the experience better for your customers and improving results for the, for the company. The last point is closing the loop. And we know that many times a call ends uh, with the customer really not understanding uh, what, what is the next step that happens. We, don't, we can't understand whether they got the service that they wanted. And asking a question at the end of the call or you know, routing them to, to, to do this on the IVR hasn't been very successful. So we have come up through an acquisition that we, that we, that we did uh, about a year and a half ago, a company called Fizzback, uh, a solution to, to provide uh, survey and operationalizing the feedback from the survey to close the loop on that call to understand if the agent did the right thing, to understand whether there's an opportunity for us to do things better uh, with the customer and to align the incentives of, of, of the company to our goals and to make sure that the loop is closed. So these are the four components of what we offer today. And as you see, this is way beyond recording. We started as a recording company. That's the place where we, where we did. And what I want to share with you a little bit is, is our history, because this is, shows you a little bit how a company can grow from being a company that starts in one field to do things which are very different from where they started from. And our, our history is very interesting, because for 20 years, till 2006, we were focused on recording. That was mainly the things that, that we did, and many of you are our client, our customers as well, and we appreciate your business. For 20 years, we were focused on 
cutting edge technology for recording. We were focused on strong partnerships with the uh, infrastructure players in Contact Center, and we were focused on America. Most of our business was in America in these years. Uh, Till this date, 60% of the business is America, but we have 40% in other regions as well. And from 2006, uh, the, the company understood we cannot stay a recording company because recording was maturing as a business. We needed the growth to continue to fuel our growth. And from 2006, we've done some very, uh, very bold acquisitions. Some of these are Israeli companies, which we've bought. So for instance, uh, the, the company Igloo that shows up here, uh, Actimize, Igloo is the company that does real-time uh, interaction, so what we talked about, desktop analytics. The company Actimize is a company that helps prevent financial fraud uh, in the banking system. These are Israeli startups that were bought by, by NICE, again, fueling that type of ecosystem we talked about before, but many of these companies are not Israeli. So IEX, the, the global leader in workforce management, which got us into uh, this business of, of uh, how to engage the workforce. This was an American company which we bought in 2006. Um, Fizback, as I said, was a British company. We bought it uh, a year and a half ago. Merced, an American company. Uh, a lot of innovation internally, but also augmented with these uh, acquisitions to help build these applications. And these applications are a, a very, very important component of our business today. I can tell you in the US, over 50% of our business is applications. It's not recording anymore. Um, and we're striving to do this in the rest of the world as well. And Again, as, 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 as uh, you people in your organizations, you can try to understand uh, if we can help you solve your business problems around engagement with your customers. Uh, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to, to continue that dialogue with you later on. And how are we doing in terms of business results? Uh, as I said, global leaders uh, in the fields that we are today. So workforce optimization, which is kind of the, uh, the way analysts analyze our market. Uh, we are uh, by far the global leader, over 40% of the, uh, of the market uh, totally. As you can see there, uh, North America, uh, 28%, and EMEA, 40%. Workforce management, with, which is that software which we talked about, around 35%. So clear leadership, and, and this leadership is part of our DNA. Uh, we uh, talk about being only in markets in which we can lead and exiting markets in which we, we follow or we don't see a way for us to be leaders in. And for us, which is an Israeli company, which our headquarters are in Israel, our management team is around the world, but the, 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 uh, the, the, the basis of it is in, is in Israel, for us to say we want to be global leaders in every field we are, this is a bold statement which we've be ab been able to deliver upon. So I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss with you uh, both the, uh, the Israeli story of innovation and entrepreneurship and to share with you the NICE story. And I hope that I was able to show you how NICE was able to grow from being a company that formed from the, the world of recording uh, and from, came from uh, uh, the, the military background to grow and to, uh, to become a global leader in the field of enterprise software applications for uh, uh, the world of, of, of service providers. So thank you again for, uh, for the opportunity and I wish you uh, the best in the rest of uh, your conversations today.